Hokey dokey. What's a derivative? A derivative is just the slope of a function at one point, otherwise known as the instantaneous rate of change. Rate of change, meaning slope, and instantaneous meaning at one point. So if we think about a random function, you might ask, well, what do you mean by the slope at one point? Because the slope at point A would be the same as the slope at point B. And that is correct in this case because the graph is of a line. It's a linear function, which means it has a constant slope the entire time. But how about on a curve like this? The slope of the function at points A and B must be different from one another. In fact, the slopes of this function are constantly changing as you go from left to right. And so the question is, how do we actually find the slope at one point? Let's say we wanted to find the slope at point A. All we can tell right now is that the function has a positive slope at point A. And with prior knowledge, really all we know how to do right now is find the slope between two points. And so if you ever need to estimate the slope at one point, or estimate the instantaneous rate of change at one point, what we can do is pick a point to the right and to the left of the desired point. And then what we'll do is find the slopes between these left and right points. In other words, if we have x1, y1, and x2, y2, we would just find the slope between those two points using slope formula. And that will serve as a great estimate for the slope right at the one point. And if we keep bringing these left and right points closer to the middle point, and we keep finding the slope between these left and right points, we will continue to get a closer approximation or closer estimate for the slope right at the one point. And so if we bring these left and right points closer to the middle point and we keep getting better and better slopes, you'd think theoretically if we could pick two left and right points right up against that middle point, then we'd have a really, really good estimate. So good that it must be pretty exact. And that's the idea behind behind the limit definition of a derivative. If you look closely at this expression here, this is super similar to the slope formula. So what's our slope formula? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. If you think about it, y2 and y1 are just the function values that correspond to x2 and x1. And if the idea is that we want to pick two points that are so, so close together, then it's almost like x2 is the same thing as x1 plus just a super, super small decimal. It's almost like you're taking x1 and adding zero to it. Therefore, on the bottom, if x2 is just x1 plus a super, super small decimal, and then we're subtracting x1, x1s go away, and we're just left with this super small decimal on the bottom. And if they're telling us here that h is approaching 0, it's almost like h is getting super, super close to 0, but it's not exactly 0. And so that's exactly what's going on with this slope formula over here. And so whenever you see this, just think about it as the slope between two points that are really, really, really close together. In other words, the slope at one point. Whenever you see this huge limit definition expression, don't be intimidated by it. Just think of it as the derivative of the function f of x at x equals a. In other words, the slope at one point, that point being a. And one more thing, when we drop the limit out in front and we just keep this quotient, this is what's known as the difference quotient. All right, let's talk tangent lines versus secant lines. As we see here, a tangent line is a line that intersects the function at one point. And to better describe it, it kind of has this skimming the surface behavior to it. So it kind of just skims the function at that one point and keeps it moving. An important fact about tangent lines is this. If you were to find the derivative of this orange curve at this point, the derivative of the function at that point would be equal to the slope of the tangent line passing through the function at that point. So the derivative at one point equals the slope of the tangent line passing through that one point. And so when you see any of these phrases or representations, these are all synonymous. The derivative instantaneous rate of change, slope at one point, slope of the tangent line, and then this limit definition of a derivative. Now a secant line intersects a function at two or more points. 
Usually you'll just see it intersecting at two points. If we were to identify these two points on the function and find the slope between them, the slope between these two points would equal the slope of the secant line. And so all of these are synonymous terms. Average rate of change, slope between two points, slope of the secant line, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. There are some functions, like this one, where you can't find the derivative at every single point. In other words, there might be one point on this function where you cannot find the slope, and that's at this point at the top here. Because you could say the point at the top has a positive slope, or you could say it has a negative slope, or maybe you'd say it has a flat slope or a zero slope. But the idea is, because it comes to this sharp corner, this sharp point, there's really no way of telling exactly what the slope value is. In other words, we cannot find the derivative. The derivative does not exist. Therefore, it's what we call not differentiable or non-differentiable. To be differentiable means that the derivative exists at all points. Or if you were to say that a function is differentiable at, say, x equals a, then that means you can find the slope of that function at x equals a. And so sharp corners is one example of non-differentiability. In other words, where you can't find the slope. If you have any function with any sort of hole or other discontinuity, then the function will not be differentiable at that discontinuous point. In addition to finding the slope of a function at one point, you can actually find entire functions that will tell you the slope of another function at any one x value. In other words, derivative functions. For example, if f of x is equal to x squared, its derivative function is 2x. And so this function, 2x, can be used to find the slope at any one point of this function, x squared. So, for example, at x equals 1, the derivative is equal to 2 times 1, or 2. Again, this derivative value of 2 actually tells us the slope of this function at x equals 1. Another example would be, at x equals 3, the derivative is equal to 2 times 3, or 6. And so 6 is the slope of the function x squared at x equals 3. And so, in general, the takeaway is this. The y values, or the outputs generated by the derivative function, are equal to the slopes of the original function at any x value. And so let's think about what else this means. Whenever the outputs of the derivative function are positive, that means that the original function has a positive slope. And whenever the outputs of the derivative function are negative, that means that the original function has a negative slope. And whenever the derivative is equal to zero, that means that the original function has a zero slope, or a flat slope. And so let's actually consider this example on a graph. We have our original function x squared, and we have our derivative function 2x. Wherever our original function has decreasing behavior or a negative slope, that's where the derivative function will have negative y values or exist below the x-axis. Likewise, wherever the original function has a positive slope, the derivative function will have positive y values or exist above the x-axis. And so I don't have to keep saying the derivative function. Let's actually talk about some of the representations of the derivative of y equals f of x. So the first one we've already seen is f prime. So f with that little apostrophe is known as f prime. So we would say this is f prime of x. Generally, f is equal to y, and so y prime is another one df over dx is another one. So again, these all just represent the first derivative of the function f. Specifically, this is the derivative of f with respect to x. And again, y is equal to f. And so there's also dy over dx. In other words, the derivative of y with respect to x. Again, these are all just first derivative representations of y equals f of x. So again, f prime, y prime, df over dx, and dy over dx. And this extends to second derivatives. And so instead of just f prime for a second derivative, you might see f double prime with the two apostrophes. You might see y double prime with the two apostrophes. You might see d squared f over dx squared. And similarly, you might see d squared y over dx squared. Again, these all represent the second derivative. I wouldn't worry too much about knowing exactly what the second derivative means. Really, it's just finding the derivative twice. But I would just suggest 
being able to recognize these as the second derivative. Another representation that you might see, so I'll go ahead and throw in here, is df over dx prime. If you happen to see this, just know that this actually does represent the second derivative because df over dx on the inside represents the first derivative and the apostrophe on the outside represents the derivative as well. And so what we have is the derivative of the derivative and that represents the second derivative. So let's talk about finding the derivative of a polynomial function. We're going to use two methods. The first method will use the formal limit definition of a derivative, and the second method will use something known as the power rule. So this was our limit definition. Let's go ahead and talk through how to find the derivative of 2x squared minus 7x plus 3. When we look at this, what do we see? We see f of x plus h and f of x. So our goal is to find these two expressions. And then once we have them, we'll go ahead and plug them into this expression and calculate the limit. So f of x is already given to us. f of x is just 2x squared minus 7x plus 3. Finding f of x plus h might be the somewhat trickier part, but let's break it down. What does it mean to find f of x plus h? If we see x plus h in the parentheses, whatever is in the parentheses will be substituted into the function wherever we see x. And so what I'll do is just kind of rewrite the function, but wherever we see x, we're actually gonna plug in x plus h. And so this is what we're looking for, but what we need to do typically is expand everything. And so let's work that out here. The first step is expanding x plus h squared. Remember to treat this as x plus h times x plus h so that we can distribute out all these terms properly. I'll go ahead and distribute the minus seven to the x plus h, so we get minus seven x minus seven h plus three on the end. I'll leave the two on the outside, and now let's talk about x plus h squared. We get x squared plus x h plus h x plus h squared. If we combine like terms, x h and h x are the same, so really we had plus two x h, and then if we distribute the two, we have our final f of x plus h. So now, again, all we need to do is plug in f of x and plug in f of x plus h. And so to demonstrate, we have f of x plus h minus f of x, and we are going to divide this all by h. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this limit off to the side until the very end. And so let's just keep simplifying what we have here. It's important to keep the f of x terms all in parentheses because all these terms will have a negative distributed to them. And once we distribute it, we'll have minus 2x squared plus 7x minus 3. We can drop these parentheses and then combine like terms. Plus 3 cancels with minus 3. 2x squared cancels with minus 2x squared. Minus 7x cancels with plus 7x. And let's gather what we're left with. We have 4xh plus 2h squared minus 7h, all divided by h. Now all the terms up top have an h, so if we factor out an h on top, we'll have h times 4x plus 2h minus 7. Because we factored out an h, we can actually cancel h's on top and bottom, and all we're left with is 4x plus 2h minus 7. So just as a note, what we just calculated so far is actually known as the difference quotient, going back to what we mentioned earlier. But it's when we actually evaluate the limit as h approaches zero that we find the derivative from the difference quotient. And so to evaluate the limit as h approaches zero, that really just means we're going to plug in zero for h. And when we do that, the two times h or two times zero goes to zero. And all we're left with is 4x minus seven. And this is our derivative function of 2x squared minus 7x plus three. So now let's talk about finding the derivative of the same function, but with something known as the power rule. The power rule is a much faster, more efficient method usually used when you're trying to find the derivative of a polynomial function or really any power function. That is any terms that have the form x to the a where a is a constant. And so let's jump into it. To find the derivative, starting with this first term, 2x squared, what we'll do, we'll bring out the two exponent and multiply it by the two that's out in front. 2 times 2 is 4. We leave the x, and then we will subtract 1 from the exponent to get 1. So we have 4x to the first, or just 4x. And then we move on to the next term. We have minus 7x, or minus 7x to the first. So if we extend the same idea and bring out the 1, multiply it by the negative 7, we still have negative 7, or minus 7. And if we leave the x and subtract 1 from the exponent again, we'll get x to the 0 but anything to the zero power is just one. 
And so minus 7 times 1 is just minus 7. And so the big rule here is anytime you have a constant times x, the derivative is always just the constant or the coefficient in front of the x term. And the last term just plus 3, you could say that 3 is the same as 3 times 1. And you could say that 1 is equal to x to the 0. So if we do the same thing and bring the 0 out and multiply it by the 3, we will get 0 for that term. And so that'll 0 out whatever the x term is here. And so basically all that goes away and all we're left with is 4x minus 7. And just like that, we found the derivative function and it matches the same one we got before, but we found it in a much faster way. So because it's fast, I just want to work out one more example of the power rule. 3 times 4 is 12. We leave the x, subtract the exponent by 1 to get 2. Bring out the 2. 2 times 12 is 24. The minus stays there. We subtract 1 from the exponent to get x to the first, or just x. Any constant times x has a derivative of just that constant. And any constant has a derivative of 0. And so just like that, we found a derivative of another polynomial function. So the big takeaway from this, the derivative of any constant times x is just that constant. And the derivative of any constant is 0. I hope you enjoyed this quick intro video on derivatives, and I hope you learned something. If you have any questions on anything, please let me know.